The first lesson is found in the book of Romans, chapter 8, beginning with verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. The psalm reading is found in Psalm 139, beginning with verse 23. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is an offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter 26, beginning with verse 36. Glory to you, Lord. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell, on his face. he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch for me one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left, so he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. He may be seated. <clears throat> let's pray. Mm, dear Jesus, we desire to be in your presence this morning. And as you told us through Pastor Jeff last week, we have the ability to be so close to you that we can feel your breath on our skin as you whisper in our ears, I love you, and we desire to be that close to you again this week. You told us that we have one foot in the sanctuary and the other in your throne room in heaven, and we believe that, God. And so as we turn our attention to your truth, we ask, Holy Spirit, let that be true. Let us be so close to you that as we bring our hearts as a gift to you, King Jesus, that we can know that you are there to receive it. And so, Holy Spirit, take me out of your way so that you can have your way with your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, for those of you who are from the Good Shepherd community, you know that at the beginning of the month, Pastor Jeff received what he felt was a word from the Lord about Good Shepherd. And the word that he received was that God's people were supposed to take a deep breath and we were to enter a season of revival before we jump into the new vision and the new mission statement that God has for us here at Good Shepherd. And so we've tried to be faithful to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and we've entered into a season of prayer and praise and worship and surrender, surrender to our God, our God who comes week after week to strengthen us and to encourage us and to be, help us to be still and know that he is God. But he's come week after week to tell us he's not just any old little G God, he's the big G God. He's the Lord God Almighty. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we didn't read this in Psalm 139, but do you realize, let me just do that. The, the creator of the heavens and the earth knows us by name. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He knows us that intimately. How cool is that? He is our Lord God Almighty, and he searches us, and he knows us. And he helps give us the desire to be revived and renewed and refreshed. And it is his desire for us to be here in worship week after week so that he can prepare our hearts to praise him. So that he can prepare us to worship him both here and in our homes. He brings us here on Sunday morning to prepare our hearts so that we can remember his greatness and his power and his presence in our lives. Because as we all know it, it's rough out there. And we need to know who he is. We need to know that he is so intimate with us that he's with us in our cars and he's standing beside us in our as we stand in our jobs and he walks the hallways with us in our schools and in our workplaces. He's in our homes. He sends the Holy Spirit to let our homes be a sanctuary against the world. He invites us to be that close to him. Today we, we turn our attention to what does it mean to have the power of a surrendered life. I know some of you are already groaning. I'm not up here to tell you what to do with your life. I really am not. And I don't think this message is for me. I believe that it's from the Lord. And so I just ask you just to bear with me. Because the way that we look at the word surrender is not the way that the world looks at it. So when I say the word surrender, come on, tell me what, you, what do you think first off? Give up? Okay. Okay. Somebody said good luck last week, last service. What else? What? Give, mm -hmm. Give it all. Mm -hmm. Have any of you thought of it in, the, in a military term? Lost. Lost, yeah. Have you thought about, uh, in a military term, it's defeat, right? Because you've got two opposing armies, and this one thinks that they are really strong, but they're not, and this one starts to defeat them. And so the commander of this army looks at what's going to happen when this one overcomes them, and he says, sorry, men and women, but you need to lay down your weapons, throw up your arms, wave the white flag, and we better hope that the commander of this army is graceful and merciful because they're about to overtake us, and we're going to surrender to them. <clears throat> and when you surrender in the military, it's usually... Um, you. You don't get a say in, in what the army overtaking you does. You're just at their mercy. That's how the world looks at surrender. It's defeat. But let me tell you that as a Christian, we don't look at surrender in the terms of defeat. We look at it in the terms of victory. Because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ already defeated our enemy, sin, death, and the devil. Romans 8 tells us if God is, if Christ is for us, who can be against us, right? And then we have that long list. If these, can any of these separate us from the love of God? No, not even death can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We look at surrender in victory, not in defeat. But I want to tell you <clears throat> that before Christ came into our lives, and without a surrendered life, 
you and I are at war with God. We are at war with God because, as Romans 8 tells us, we do not submit ourselves to him, and we are hostile to God because our minds are set on our sinful nature and on death. In our former lives before Christ, we had not surrendered to God's love and his law. Instead, we were our own masters, doing our own will, robbing God of everything he wants to give to us. But then we know that God doesn't leave us there. And a miracle happens, and Jesus Christ comes, and as John 3 tells us, we are born again, and everything turns around. We no longer live according to our sinful nature with our minds on death and, um, and on sin, but we are now controlled by the Holy Spirit. And he comes, and he changes our mindset. In our new life in Christ, we no longer fear giving up our lives to Christ because we understand that if Jesus is for us, nothing can be against us. I'll say it again. If Christ is for us, nothing in this world can be against us. We are no longer driven by a desire to withhold ourselves from Christ when he comes into our lives. We eagerly want to totally surrender everything to him. We trust him that he supplies everything for us. When we first come to Christ, when we are new believers, when we, are, uh, when we come back to Christ after a prodigal journey, we surrender our lives to God and we show complete faith in him and we believe in his promises. We understand and that if we can trust God with our salvation, then we can trust Jesus Christ with our daily needs. If we can trust Jesus with our salvation, then we should be able to trust him to hear us when we cry out to him and tell him that the things that, we are, uh, that are coming against us are too much for us to deal with, and we need him to come and take over. We understand that by surrendering our daily moment-by-moment choices to Jesus, that he comes and he takes over our life. And things change. But I have to tell you that as this couple of weeks have gone on, I've just realized that there's something that has changed, fundamentally changed. It feels like it to me anyway, the last few years. It feels like surrendering to God hasn't been as easy as it used to be. It feels like the things that the world is experiencing makes it harder to trust. It makes it harder to give up our lives. It makes it harder to give up control. Because it seems like the world is telling us to live in fear and to live controlling everything. And <clears throat> that's not how God wants us to live our lives. And I wonder what has changed. And I don't ask that of you because I think all of you changed. I think something inside of me changed as well. I remember when I was a first a baby Christian. And I would go out in the world and all I could do was talk about Jesus to a point of being annoying. And I had many people say, don't you talk about anything but Jesus? I said, no, that's the, he's the only thing that matters. But somehow in the last few years, it feels like the world has taken over those spaces inside of me that I used to just easily give up to him. I don't know about you, but for me, it feels like Satan has come and his harassment has been ferocious. You know, in John 10.10, 10, Jesus tells us that Satan doesn't come to harass us. He doesn't come to annoy us. Or pester us. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy us. And I don't know about you, but it seems like he's been on the war path. And he's been having a heyday. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I want to go back to living the other side of John 10.10. Where Jesus says, I come to give you life. And not just any ordinary life. I come to give you life abundantly. That's the life we're supposed to be living. That's the victorious life. That's the surrendered life. We give everything to him because God's mercies are new every single day. 
And so what happened yesterday or what happened last year or two years ago or 10 years ago should not be taking up space inside of our worrying and our anxiety. And it should not have any room right now to be disturbing us because Christ took all of those burdens to the cross with him. If we surrender them to him, they're dead and they're gone and we, should, we have no business bringing them back. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you this morning, are you willing to make an unconditional surrender to Jesus Christ? Are you willing to let go of the past and follow the vision that he has for your life? Are you willing to ask hard questions so that God can tell us what it is that we need to give up in order to make room for the vision that God has for our lives? Because the world has changed and he still has plans for us, but what are those plans and what do they look like? If you want to see change happen in your life, then you've got to let go of the old. And you have to get a vision from God that goes beyond what we've already seen and experienced. We've got to invite the new. We've got to trust God and follow the examples of people from the past who have completely surrendered their lives, especially when it didn't make any sense. We've got to follow the example of people like Abraham who followed God. He said, give up everything and go to this land. I'm not even going to tell you where it is yet. You just follow me and I'll get you there. We need to follow examples like Hannah who waited patiently for the timing of God to give her a baby even before she knew she was pregnant. We need to follow the example of Mary who was so excited excited about the expectant miracle that was happening inside of her, even though she had no idea what it was going to do ultimately in changing her life. And what about Peter? Peter, who surrendered his whole life to God before he knew what it meant to be a fisher of men. What does it mean to have the power of a surrendered life? It means victory in Jesus. It means getting to a place of full, complete surrender of every single part of our lives and giving it all to God. It means coming to the end of ourselves and the beginning of the life that Christ wants for us in him. It means giving up our past regret, our present problems, our future ambitions, our fears and our dreams and our weakness and our habits and our hurts and our hang-ups and especially our will. We are willful people. And it's a good thing when we give it up to God and we are following his will. But it is not a good thing when we are rebellious and we are living under our will. But being fully surrendered to God means giving up being afraid. Surrendering to God means believing that nothing under his control will ever be out of control. For his will for us is perfect. For those of you who were watching or who were here last week, you heard Pastor Jeff um, invite us to close our eyes and visualize being in the throne room of heaven. You remember that? It was hard to do. I don't know about you, but the world doesn't allow our minds to be quiet most of the time. And so to close our eyes and visualize being somewhere in the throne room of heaven, as Pastor Jeff described Isaiah being there um, in the Holy of Holies, it's hard to do. And if we don't practice it, we won't be able to understand the power of that kind of prayer. But I also believe that if we are really, truly going to surrender our lives back to Jesus, if we are going to give ourselves over to him, we have to go into the Holy of Holies because God is calling us to lay down our lives on the altar of God. We need Jesus to help us come to the end of ourselves and come to the beginning of Jesus who's at the throne room inviting us this morning to come and to lay ourselves on the altar and surrender our will to his. We have to give up the illusion that we have to be perfect before we get there. We have to give up the illusion that the Holy Spirit has to somehow perfect our righteousness and our worthiness before we get to the Holy of Holies. That's not true. Jesus, when he surrendered his life on the cross and he died, he 
tore the curtain in half. And he said, come in to the Holy of Holies. And there's nothing separating us from him anymore. So today we need to go into the Holy of Holies. We need to get to that place where Jesus comes and he breathes his breath inside of us. And he gives us his eyes to see and his ears to hear and his words to speak blessing and life over people, not curses and death. If we want Jesus to take control of our lives, we've got to go to his altar and ask him to help us get to a point where we give up everything. And he gives us his direction and his breath and his ability to surrender. We have to come to the end of ourselves, and we've got to come to the beginning of Jesus. Like Isaiah, who needed the Holy Spirit to bring those coals and put them on his lips because he had unclean lips, you and I have unclean places where we need the seraphim to come and to put the hot coals in us as well because in the Holy of Holies, we need to surrender it. We need the fire of God to burn everything up, the impure, the unholy, everything that separates us from the love of God. We need him to take it away and to remove it. We need him to burn up our worry. And remove it, because worry does not add any days to our lives. In fact, Philippians 4 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for what he has done. We need to go to the Holy of Holies and surrender ourselves and ask God to burn up our desire to be in control, because you and I know that's the hardest thing to give up, because without control, you and I are vulnerable. But when we relinquish our control over to God, we recognize his authority. And we let him lead us as we acknowledge that he's already in control. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to purify us on the altar this morning. So that he will take away the things that don't need and don't work in our lives. If we allow God to purify us, he will bring to us the things that are important and the things that are necessary for us to follow him and to surrender to him. If we surrender to him, the Holy Spirit will come and he will give us provision. And he will allow us to prosper where we are. And he will give us protection. And he will give us knowledge and understanding and discernment. And he will increase the gifts of the Spirit in our lives. But we have to start with laying down our lives on the altar and saying, God, I am dead to self. Make me alive in Christ. We've got to cry out this morning, God, I lay it all down. Everything that is in me, I surrender to you. Come and cleanse me. Come and make me dead to the old. Come and put your spirit in me that I may live in the new creation that you made of me through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We've got to get to that point. You see, men and women of God, we can no longer come here and play church. We can't play religion anymore. We've got to get serious. The time is coming that Jesus is coming back. And how is he going to find us? Will he find us fully surrendered? Will he find us living in the newness of life given to us through the Holy Spirit who makes us alive in Christ, who makes us on fire for Christ, who gives us the ability to fully surrender and give our ability and our faith over to Christ, saying, God, take my life, take it all. I don't want it anymore, Jesus. Your will be done in my life. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of running. And I don't want to do it anymore. I just want to surrender it all back over to Jesus and let it be easy again. Our gospel reading gives us an example of Jesus surrendering his will. We know that Jesus was both fully God and he was fully human. And he says, my soul was overwhelmed to the point of death with all that is about to happen to him. Before he ever stepped out of heaven and became baby Jesus and grew up to be the adult Jesus, he was in the decision-making process with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He was fully in, 100% surrendered to the plan. I'm going to go 
I'm going to take on flesh. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to die on the cross for the sins, to take away the sins of the world. Jesus knew that. But he's fully human, and he's been walking around Jerusalem and Judea for three years, and he's seen men and women hanging on those crosses. He's heard their groans. He knows what the suffering is like. Do not let that not be part of this story. He knows what he's facing. And in his humanness, he's got to surrender fully to, Jesus, to his father. So he steps into the garden, and he bows himself down, and he says, Father, if it's possible, may you take this cup, and yet not my will, but yours. He prays it not just once. He prays it not just twice. He prays it three times. Not my will, but yours. If I have to, if there's no other way, then strengthen me and help me get there. Some of the Gospels, after he gets done praying and the soldiers come and Peter lops off the ear, um, he says, put your sword away. Am I not to drink this cup that the Father has given me? It was his, his Father's will. Now you and I, it's not God's will for us to hang on a cross, but you and I have a cross. Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. What is it that we are to surrender what do we have to give up to be full in for Jesus? I can still hear the cries of Jesus' heart as he wrestled with his father that day because sometimes the groaning of my heart and the weight of my prayers as I wrestle with God is equally as hard. To say, God, your will, not mine. Living a surrendered life doesn't mean a life of roses. It doesn't mean everything's going to be easy. In fact, sometimes it gets harder. But life surrendered in Jesus is a life lived in peace. It's a life lived hearing Jesus every day say, Come to me, all you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Every day, our Savior comes and says, Come to me and let me give you my peace. A life surrendered to Jesus is a life led by the Lord Jesus himself, who lives within us and who gives us the best for us from God's point of view. Not the world, but God's point of view. So how can you and I find power in surrendering ourselves to Jesus? One way is by crying out, God, the only way I'm going to ever get out of this mess, the only way that anything in my life is ever going to change is for me to just give it to you. And when we do, he gives us Fulfillment and satisfaction and enjoyment and peace as we surrender our lives to his. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of doing things my way. And I need God to come and help me surrender my will to his. You and I need to come to a place where we say, I want your way, not my way. I want your strength, not my strength. I want to trust you and have your truth and not the world's truth. I want you, Jesus, and you alone. Can we do this? Can we pray these things today? What will change in your life this morning if you surrendered your finances to God? What would change in your life if you surrendered your marriages, if you surrendered your children, if you surrendered your jobs? What would change in your life if, if you surrendered your health? And your future over to Jesus. What would change if you gave even those parts of your heart and those parts of yourself that you don't even want God to know about? What if we surrendered those to him today? How would your life change and how would you look different? Psalm 139 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any grievous, offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus wants us to be praying that prayer. It's a beautiful surrender prayer. 
Show me what it is I need to give to you and then give me the ability to give it to you. When we do that, life really begins. And it's life at its best when it's lived for Jesus. Life at its best is fully surrendered to God. Life at its best is a life that discovers how much God truly loves us. Life at its best understands that not only does God have plans for our lives, but God's got perfect and the very best plans for our life, plans that can't be improved upon because his plan for us is eternal life. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any grievous or offensive way inside of me. Show me what it is and then help me get rid of it so I can be led into life everlasting. When we pray that, we hold nothing back. And it's important for us because ultimately when we take our last breath here in this life and every single one of us, despite thinking that we are not going to, we all will die someday and we'll take our last breath here. And ultimately when we do, the most important thing, when we take our first breath in heaven is going to be our relationship in God through Jesus Christ. So how is your relationship with Jesus, and what do we need him to do for us today to get us to a place of full surrender? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, everyone sitting here this morning knows just how hard life is without you. We all know what it's like when the world crushes in around us. We all have had times where it's almost impossible to surrender everything to you. But Jesus, today we've heard you, and we want to do it. So please come and take our life. Consecrate us to you, Lord. Take our moments and take our days. For those who are going up to camp, especially take their hands and take their feet and let them be swift in giving your love to the little ones. Take our voices and take our lips and fill them with your message of hope and your message of grace and your message of love. Jesus, take our silver and take our gold, take our intellect, take our will and make it yours. Take our heart and take our love. And Lord, give us the ability to pour ourselves at your feet. And surrender ourselves to you. Please take us. And let your will be done. In all our lives we pray in Jesus name. Amen.